All right, welcome everybody. Thanks for being here. We're about to get started. Give everyone just a minute or two to get uh, logged in. Just a moment. And uh, I think we'll get started and thank you for joining us. This is our uh, effort to keep you up to date on what's going on regarding some tax proposals and the financial planning implications for that. Uh, I'm Chris Boyd, uh, the leader of Asset Management Resources. We have a great uh, group of uh, our panelists today. I'm joined by my brother, F. Keats Boyd III. He is the president of Boyd & Boyd PC, the law firm that specializes in estate planning here on the Cape. Also joined uh, by uh, members of our team at Asset Management Resources. I'm joined by Scott Birmingham, he is uh, an investment advisory representative, uh, a financial planner, and uh, uh, sort of our lead financial planner, also our, our chief compliance officer. Also joined by Mike Perna, also a CFP, and um, has been uh, a, an active financial planner for many, many years now, and joined our firm over a decade ago. So with that, let's jump into our plan today. We're going to be talking about some of the plans that are being talked about and proposed right now. A lot of the uh, details we're going to be talking about are, are uh, anticipated. They, they have not yet been put into law. So we're going to be talking about what may happen, but it'll help you to give some thought to how to plan for that. We'll also talk about some potential market-related consequences or questions that that might generate and some financial planning and estate planning strategies that you may want to uh, consider as you decide to uh, evaluate how to deal with these potential implications. Let's jump right in and talk about some of the things that are proposed when it comes to income and capital gains taxes. And um, I'm gonna go through all these in more detail, but just start off with a little heads up of what we're gonna be talking about initially. Start things off, there's a discussion of increasing tax rates for those who make an income of $400,000 or more. We'll also be talking about the idea of higher capital gains for those with gains of a million dollars or an income of a million dollars. Um, changes to the corporate tax rate, um, the estate tax changes, and uh, potential uh, changes in how Social Security is taxed. I feel like I'm doing the Jeopardy uh, lineup here for everybody as categories. So in any case, um, let's start with the, the, this, what's being discussed for the increases in the tax rate. One of the things we don't know yet is for uh, single filers, whether it will be half this amount or whether it's $400,000 for all filers. But right now, it's been talked about joint filers having, uh, with an income in excess of $400,000, a tax rate change going up to 39.6%. As it stands right now, uh, you can see the, over the past several years, we've had some changes. In 2017, there was a different tax rate uh, the top tax rate then was 39.6%, but it started at a higher threshold and there was a 35% threshold uh, that was in ex when people had an income over 400,000. After the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, that 35% tax bracket was much larger for the band of income and the top tax rate was 37%. What may happen is we may see that uh, ta higher taxes start at lower income levels or lower than they have been. So at 400,000, that's one of the things we're anticipating. There's also some changes that are expected on uh, itemized deductions, limiting how much one can take uh, with their itemized deductions. Additionally, let's go on to talk about the higher capital gains expectations. Um, for people who have um, capital gains, have uh, qualified dividends, this, this is, they pay currently a reduced rate on uh, those taxes. Uh, this will affect people who have income in excess of a million dollars. Uh, at least that's what's expected. 
Um, and let's recognize that that often affects people who are selling an asset. So we'll talk about that in just a moment. Currently, the top tax rate for these kinds of circumstances is 20%. What's proposed is that the change to the income tax rate, which would be 39.6%, let's call it 40%. So almost a doubling of the tax implications when certainly when there are capital gains uh, instances. So who's this likely to affect? It may, it may be more often than you expect. Not all of us uh, necessarily make an income of over a million dollars every year, but you may have instances where you have uh, consequences that could drive you into an income over a million dollars. Sometimes people have significant uh, stock exposure that could uh, you know, be prompted to have a sale that could uh, create a, an instance. A business being sold, someone has a farm or investment properties or even a second home, sometimes even a primary residence, although there are some windows for uh, how much you, know, you can um, avoid with a primary residence, you still could be in a situation where you may run into uh, big, being pulled into this situation of more than a million dollars for a capital gain that would drive you into an income tax that would be much higher. Uh, keep in mind, people who have investment properties or rent out a second home, you may be depreciating that asset and that can drive that capital gain to be larger when, at the time of the sale. So one of the things we wanna keep in mind that uh, Less now, more later. You know, the the because of the current circumstances of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, um, it is uh, less rate now. But we know that that uh, a lot of the terms of that the sunset, so it will be more later anyway. Whether it's under the current tax law or proposed changes, so you may want to think about doing something sooner than later. Uh, potential new tax laws could drive those higher as well. But we know even without that, there will be higher rates on some of these income circumstances. Um, there are some second you know, thoughts to be uh, keep in mind. There could be some headaches. Uh, there is the possibility of an alternative minimum tax. Uh, there are some uh, increases in Medicare premiums when your income goes higher or you have significant capital gains in a given year. And there is the possibility that this could be a retroactive taxation. And we'll talk about all of these a little more. Simply an alternative minimum tax, what is it? It's a second bite at the apple, essentially. There's an alternative calculation on high earners that uh, they could pay more tax by a different manner of calculation. And uh, it's pr usually pretty large sums of income as it stands today. Um, as this, uh, this income's over a million dollars uh, before you hit into the, uh, the likelihood of that. When it comes to Medicare premiums, you know, if, you're, if you have Medicare, keep in mind, premiums are determined by your income about two years prior. So when it comes to your, your income, it can drive you into different premium rates for your monthly ex, you know, expense for your premium, uh, for your participation in Medicare. So there's a calculation uh, that will essentially take into account various aspects of uh, your income and based on, and capital gains may be part of that and it can drive your premiums up. So it's just essentially another tax. It makes people crazy in their retirement when they get hit by this, especially if they're not aware it may be coming. But think of it, because there's a big difference between $150 or $200 a month and $500 a month, as an example. So, but keep in mind, it's just another manner, a portion of the tax you will pay for some of these kinds of circumstances. And we'll talk a little bit more about the retroactivity later in the presentation. So um, one of the other possibilities that may be coming is a change to the corporate tax rates. We are anticipating, uh, you know, currently we have about a 21% uh, 
uh, corporate tax rate. Uh, we are anticipating that that will go up. It used to be that we went from 35% down to 21%. We weren't as competitive in the world, and that's what drove people to want to bring the corporate tax rate down to draw business, uh, businesses to stay. We had companies you know, leave, moving their headquarters and things like that. Now we are um, seem to be competitive. Uh, moving the tax rate to 28% is being proposed. It does seem like there's some negotiations going on, whether that will be 28%. 25% remains to be seen. But there is also the talk, not only here at home, but also with other countries around the world, uh, the, the Biden administration is facilitating a 15% minimum tax on corporations, uh, companies that have significant profits, but report uh, limited taxable income. So, um, Remains to be seen how that what will actually happen, but that's relevant as we when we think about how this might play into your portfolio. We'll come back and talk about more of that later. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about the state tax proposals, some of the changes that are being proposed. And to do that, I'm going to introduce my brother, Keats Boyd, to take it from here. Good afternoon, everybody. So uh, we've got a few proposals that we're keeping our eyes on. The first one is a proposal from Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont. He's called this the For the 99.5% Act. Uh, basically, what he's trying to do is generate additional estate tax revenues by changing the way we're structuring the estate tax system. Uh, right now, our estate tax rate for estate gift and generation skipping transfer tax is a flat rate of 40%. Uh, Senator Sanders has proposed increasing those rates to a 45, 50, 55, and a 65% rate for very, very large estates. Uh, the 45, 50, and even the 55% rates are something that many of our clients need to pay attention to. The next important point is the exemption, the amount you're able to pass at death without having to pay an estate tax uh, Senator Sanders is proposing to lower that from the current level of seven, oh, excuse me, 11.7 million down to three and a half million. And that would mean if you're married right now, you can pass a, a little over $23 million without having to worry about an estate tax. Under Senator, uh, Senator Sanders' proposal, that would increase to, for married couples, a combined amount of about $7 million. But you know, we're telling a lot of clients who have significant assets. Uh, you may, even if you're under the $7 million married, or if you're under $3.5 million single, you may want to consider using up an awful lot of your exemption now through gifts. Uh, that GST and the state tax exemption right now is, uh, and, and the gift tax exemption, they're all unified at $11.7 million. If you use up more than uh, $3.5 million, they're not going to try to recover that from you but they may say that you have no more exemption left to use at death. Coupled with that is this idea that Senator Sanders wants to lower the gift tax exemption that you can give during your lifetime without having to write a check out to the IRS from its current level of 11.7 million down to only $1 million. So we'd have this difference between the gift tax exemption amount and the estate tax exemption amount uh, would be you know uh, out of sync with each other. You could only give one million during your lifetime, and if you give more than that, you'd have to write a check to the IRS and pay a tax. But at death, you can give up to three and a half million before you have to pay a tax. It's a good idea this year to give away a fair amount of your exemption now while you can, while you have it, before it goes away. So we want to have you consider that perhaps. Also, the proposal would lower the annual gift exclusion, the amount you can give every year without having to report the gift from its current level of 15,000, which is indexed for inflation, to only Play. 
and there is limitation pressure. on families that have significant life insurance. And, and make lots of gifts of ten. Keats, I think you're cutting out a little bit. I'm not sure if it's just me, but um, your signal seems to be intermittent. Okay, thank you for the uh, um, audience I, letting me know. Keats, your, uh, your audio has been cutting out. We didn't hear much of what you said on this slide. All right. All right. I apologize. I, my, apparently, my internet connection is weak. I'm just trying to reset that. Um, all right. Just, uh, hopefully, this will be a little bit better. Can you hear me? I all definitely right? heard. Yeah, I can hear you now. And I definitely heard the first uh, bullet fully. Okay. All right. I'm not sure if uh, I think we After probably heard that. the second so we had, bullet. Yeah. The second bullet is basically saying that the amount you can give at, at death is currently 11.7. Senator Sanders proposing to lower it to three and a half million. The gift tax exemption is being proposed to lower to only one million. So we'll have this disjointed uh, gift and estate tax exemption. And that is a concern uh, that you'd only be able to give up to $1 million without having to pay a tax. But over that, you'd actually have to write out a check to the IRS but at death, you can give as much as three and a half million dollars. So there's this disconnect between the two tax structures. Then we also have the annual gift exclusion, the amount you can give uh, during your lifetime uh, without having to report the gift. Currently, $15,000 per recipient. That's indexed for inflation. Senator Sanders is doing, uh, wants to lower that to only $10,000 per recipient and take away the indexing for inflation. Additionally, he wants to limit the ability to give to certain types of trusts to a total of $20,000 a year, which could impact especially life insurance trusts that use what we call crummy provisions, a way of giving a gift to many different people, but to one trust and getting multiple uh, annual exclusions used that would limit the ability to do that. So many uh, practitioners are suggesting if you have an irrevocable life insurance trust, you may want to front end load it this year with some extra cash in anticipation of perhaps this uh, transfer, uh, this change being put into effect. All right. Oh, sorry, there we go. All right, so the other thing we want to look at uh, is uh, we, we basically, the old law, the, the, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, changed the exemption to uh, $10 million index for inflation. So it's now $11.7 million. This is supposed to sunset in 2026, which means we're going to go back to a $5 million exemption index for inflation anyway. So whether or not Bernie Sanders gets to pass this legislation, we are looking at the issue of, should you use your exemption before you lose it? And I think for many families, this may be an important year to consider using it because it could be taken away before 2026. And so you may wanna use up as much of your exemption as possible so that you've taken full advantage of what you can pass transfer tax-free. And by structuring it the right way, we can make it so it's free from estate tax, free from generation skipping transfer taxes, uh, which is that you know, if you give to a skipped generation to grandchildren or something like that, you also have an additional tax that could be due. So we wanna look at all of these and, and in many families take advantage of it this year before some of these exemptions are gone. Another important proposal is Senator Chris Van Hollen of Maryland. He has proposed what he's calling the STEP Act, Sensible Taxation and Equity Promotion Act of 2021. This bill basically does several things. Uh, it, it's one of the biggest things though, is recognizing uh, capital gains on events that right now under the current law would not recognize a gain. So for example, if you made a gift that could trigger a capital gains event. Another thing that could be an issue is if you pass away, if you die, that under this proposal would be a capital gains recognition event. And your estate would have to pay a capital gains tax on the appreciation of any assets that you held. 
It's basically doing away with the step up in basis, which is something many families rely on to eliminate capital gains tax exposure. You know, when you die, you're able to change the cost basis under the current law from what you paid for it to whatever the date of death value is, eliminating the capital gains tax. Under the Van Hollen proposal, that wouldn't occur anymore. Instead, we'd have to pay a tax on the difference between the date of death value and what you pay for it. That would trigger a capital gains recognition event at death and would have to pay the tax on that difference. Uh, so that's a very important thing. Now, they are talking about perhaps some exclusions, and we don't know exactly how these will pan out. One of the possible exclusions would be a $1 million lifetime exemption. So you'd be able to exempt $1 million of gain at death. Also, there's another one that might be the, uh, you know, we, we think of a $500,000 exclusion on the transfer of a personal residence, but it's technically $250,000 per spouse. Uh, we're expecting something like that might be translated into this proposal as well. There'd be some limited exceptions for certain types of tangible personal property. And if you donated to a spouse or to a charity, there are often gonna be exemptions for those kinds of transfers. So we wouldn't trigger the capital gains recognition, okay? Um, under this proposal, the income taxes, the capital gains tax, that is paid by the estate would then be available as a deduction on the estate tax return. And that's to try to prevent the double taxation. But it's still, when you look at the combination of some of these proposals, we're still looking at some estates could end up with, in my opinion, a tax bill rather than uh, an inheritance for the heirs. Uh, you know, we haven't come to the Biden proposal yet of uh, increasing the 39. We've talked a little bit about it, did, uh, Chris did earlier with the 39.6% uh, income tax bracket, but that would also apply to income taxation of capital gains at death. So if you've got over a million dollar of gain recognition at death because you've got the appreciation on your home, the appreciation on your stock portfolio, and other other, other assets that have unrealized appreciation at death, death would trigger that capital gains event. And it's very easy to see ourselves reaching the million dollar threshold and be subject not just to a 20% capital gains event, but also to a 39.6% capital gains event. We'd also have the 3.8% surtax under the Affordable Care Act. And then of course, in Massachusetts, our state income tax of 5%. So we're gonna be possibly very close to a 50% capital gains event at death for many families. We're also talking about uh, forced recognition for certain types of trust every 21 years, we'd have to pay the uh, unappreciated uh, a tax on the, uh, on the unrealized gain that we've got trapped within the trust. Uh, in certain trusts that we'd have that uh, first occur in 2026. So part of the strategy here might be to force recognition of gain, to harvest gains in advance in anticipation of some of this to make sure that we're not going to hit that million dollar number. What makes this proposal most troubling is the fact that it is retroactive to January 1 of 2021. So this is something that even though it hasn't been passed, it makes it difficult for us to strategize today because we could be trapped with uh, the retroactivity under this proposal. So Keith, one of the things that you know, I think we, we want to caveat is we don't know yet what actually will pass Right. And whether or not, you know, bills will be passed as they've been proposed, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there's likely to be some, some uh, possibility of some concessions along the way. Right. So that, that's true. Um, but I do think, you know, what we're looking at here is, I, for, from an estate planning point of view, is the confluence of these various proposals. Uh, you know, the Van Hollen proposal of recognition of gain at death the uh, Sanders proposal of lowering the estate tax exemption, coupled with the Biden 39.6% capital gains bracket, when you put all of those together, many families are going to get hit with two taxes at death. The estate tax, when it's over three and a half million, and that rate is going to be up around 45, 50, or 55 percent. And you're going to add to that the capital gains recognition for certain families that have a, a combined gain, an aggregate gain of over a million dollars, 
of close to 50%, you can see that it's possible for some families to walk away with a tax bill, not, uh, not uh, an inheritance. And so th this is a significant change in tax theory. And it's going to result, in, I think, in a significant change in how we are going to strategize about taxation. It may be saying paying taxes gradually over our lifetime, rather than holding them and not paying the tax, that might be the better strategy. It, it really burn, it, burn, it, it makes it very difficult for me to say, hey, client, it's a good idea to pay a tax. I'm very tax averse, but I think in this situation, that's one of the things we may have to recognize. Okay. Anything else on this page you'd like to review or shall we? Continue? I think you can move on, yeah. So again, we've got retroactivity here um, the, and retroactivity does appear to be constitutional. We've had several cases that have come from the Supreme Court that have shown us that yes, you can have a retroactive tax as long as it is a tax that is already on the books. Capital gains tax is already on the book. Adding a new bracket, that's gonna be fine. Uh, so that's not something that I think we're gonna have the ability to uh, uh, challenge its, its constitutionality. Uh, and then, as, as I mentioned earlier, there are some exceptions to forced uh, recognition. They're going to put in a new section to the tax code, section 1261, which will exempt transfers to spouses, transfer to certain types of grantor trust, like you won't have to pay a tax because you put your assets into your revocable trust, uh, and then transfers to certain charities uh, will not trigger capital gains. Uh, personal property not used in trade or business or for the production of income would also not be subject to a force recognition. All right. Um, thanks, Keith. We'll, we'll definitely um, talk more about some strategies. And as we do, I think there may be some discrepancies in how um, an estate planning view might uh, yeah. look at these as compared to the financial planning considerations. And I'm sure you'll want to chime in a little bit as we go through some yeah. of those. One of the other things that has been proposed is increasing the Social Security tax, uh, FICA taxes. Uh, right now, there's a cap where when someone uh, has an income that exceeds $142,800, that portion no longer pays FICA taxes. They um, have a cap on the amount of, of tax that goes towards Social Security. However, what's proposed is it, you'd re-enter that taxation with incomes above 400,000. So you may have a donut where you're kind of like the, uh, the healthcare donut hole that we've you know, heard about in the past where you, know, you may have something similar when it comes to your social security where there's a portion of which you'll pay social security FICA tax, have a gap where you don't have those costs, but if your income exceeds a certain threshold, you would then be re-entered into the FICA taxation. And, you know, in an effort to try to address some of the challenges that uh, Social Security does have predictably over the uh, foreseeable future. So that brings us to some uh, market related questions and to uh, address some of these contents, um, I'll invite Mike to uh, take over the comments. Thank you, Chris. Um, we could never expect uh, a change in the tax law to have no effect on the economy. Um, they're intricately wound together. So what I've always told people is that when there is a change in the tax law, it's going to be both a direct and an indirect change. Direct, in this case, if you're in the 400 um, income, 400,000 income category, you'll be directly impacted. Okay, if you're in the 1 million long-term capital gain category, you'll be directly impacted. So the question becomes, how will you be impacted if you're not in those categories, okay? And what I've seen is what I call an indirect tax to the people who don't fall into the high level income that they're talking about, okay? So 
what are we actually, you know, looking at and worrying about long term? Okay, now the federal government is talking about uh, providing for uh, infrastructure uh, spending as well as uh, family um, uh, spending uh, in terms of um, providing uh, uh, daycare for working families and um, kindergarten for all children. Um, and all of these programs come with the cost. And the idea behind Biden's proposals, you know, is that he's going to be ta taxing the wealthy to pay the bill. But the question is, if he's trying to tax the wealthy, is there going to be any, you know, should I say, um, residual that other people are going to have to wind up paying? And the answer is quite likely yes. Now, right now, with the uh, tax proposals that um, were passed under the Trump administration, you know, we've seen the economy grow. We've seen stocks, you know, go up. And even up to this point of the year, the stock market is up 14%. Okay? That's a substantial gain. The bond index is down. Okay? Bonds are fixed income and they don't uh, go up like the stock market. In fact, many cases when the market goes up, bonds go down. So if Biden's proposals you know, are enacted into law, and, and that's a big if, okay? But in some way or form, you know, they will be changes made to the tax law. The question becomes, how then do they, you know, impact the average taxpayer? Not the guy making 400,000, but the, you know, the people who are making anywhere from, you know, 20,000 to 399,000. Um, supposedly those people aren't gonna be impacted but they will be impacted. They'll be impacted indirectly. Did you want to change the slide, Chris? Yeah, I would just make one additional comment, if I might, and that <laughs> is the, the notion that, um, you know, coming out of the pandemic, uh, we recognize that there's pent up demand that is stimulative for the economy. Additionally, as we have these uh, expenditures, the uh, uh, potentially massive amounts of government spending, um, that is also stimulative for the economy and therefore beneficial to stocks. And that's partly why we're seeing this favorable stock treatment or uh, response and why AMR and our dis uh, discretionary client portfolios where we've been modestly overweight in stocks. If okay. Conversely, just to that, or, or at least in line with that, there's been a lot of worries, Mike, about the inflation concerns. Yes. Uh, so uh, we've got a little information here to address some of those, those concepts, those concerns. Well, um, when we talk about the changes in the market and how the market is impacted by tax policy, one of the things we have to understand that if the corporate tax rate Okay, is going to be higher, okay? That'll cut into corporate profits. And what will be the result if we cut into those corporate, corporate profits? Well, it could be a couple of things. Um, it could be that stocks uh, will go down because stocks are directly related to the income streams that the corporations they represent create. So if those income streams go down, we can expect stocks to go down, okay? But it could also have other impacts and these would you know, affect many people, not just wealthy people. Um, we could also be looking at um, corporations in an attempt to lower other costs, um, laying workers off, cutting the workforce or diminishing benefits that are paid to workers. Of freezing wages, okay? And, you know, ultimately passing on higher costs to the consumer to make up 
for the income that was lost in paying taxes. So these are what I call okay, indirect taxes. Taxes that are not imposed directly on the average taxpayer. And when I say average taxpayer, I'm talking about anyone making from 20 to 399,000. But, okay, he will have to pay or she will have to pay indirectly, either by higher costs, by lower, you know, job security, um, lower benefits. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, impact that will be felt if the proposal, proposed tax changes take place you know, as they are proposed. I might add an item or two, Mike, and uh, just to go back for a moment, you know, there's a lot of worry about inflation in the news and I think it's causing consumers to have a little bit of anxiety. And I would just um, point out that as much as we are seeing, you know, higher CPI readings, you know, the 5% reading in May of 9.7% over the last three months, average annualized, you know, it, it kind of looks worse when you look at it just relative to a year ago when we were in the uh, troughs of the uh, pandemic. But if we compare it to a two year, two years back, uh, May's number is only about two and a half percent of an increase. So it's not necessarily as severe as it might appear today with some context. And, you know, I think that's an important consideration that as much as we do have concerns about monitoring this, we don't think investors should be running away from equity exposure uh, and be overstated in their concerns about inflation. We're gonna talk more about this in our quarterly webinar uh, mentioned in a page or two. Um, so, you know, on the one hand, we've got stimulus spending as an inflationary concern. On the other hand, we've got taxation, particularly, as you said, Mike, the corporate taxation can have a greater impact or adverse consequence to the economy, but uh, that's more detractive and deflationary. We've got some of these opposing forces that we want to uh, keep in mind. And so it, um, you know, it may, to some extent, balance out before we have, uh, you know, runaway inflation or, um, you know, massive uh, destruction of uh, the, the, the market's movements or something like that because of higher taxation. Uh, it's, it's a little bit of a balancing act. We'll see how things play out, what actually gets imposed and, um, you know, how the impact it has over time. Uh, as it stands for uh, AMR's uh, discretionary client accounts that are ETF and mutual fund uh, strategies, uh, we are overweight in stocks and that's how to benefit. Uh, and, you know, we expect that to be continue to be beneficial. Um, we have a tilt towards small cap exposure because of that, uh, you know, expectation. Um, and that again is likely a good hedge for inflation. Uh, we're not as um, enamored of municipal bonds for most investors. Uh, one, because we think that uh, some of that tax advantage is priced in. And then uh, inflation protected securities. We think it's also important that investors understand that there is some added interest rate risk uh, by the way they work. And so we're reluctant, not opposed, but you know, not as likely to use those as often. So if people have particular interest in learning more about our market outlook, our chief investment officer, Brian Regan, will be ho hosting a um, webinar uh, on July 25th, sorry, 22nd, the 21st at uh, 10 a.m., so if you'd like to learn about the economic and market outlook for, from AMR at that time, you'd be welcome to join us. Uh, we also will be doing more financial planning webinars. We plan quarterly webinars. We have one scheduled for September 15th at 4 p.m. Those are both Eastern time. Um, Mike, anything else to add before I move on? Well, yeah, just quickly, I want to say the... The one um, factor that I didn't talk about is the pandemic. Um, you may know that the pandemic has caused um, what we call pent up demand for certain goods and services. 
Um, and yet, you know, we're, we still are in the pandemic. It hasn't ended. And, you know, it'll, a lot is going to depend uh, on how this Delta strain plays out. Um, according to the experts, it's, you know, far more contagious and serious than the prior strains. So that's something that, you know, is sitting on the horizon. Um, they've already, uh, in, you know, acknowledged that we won't be able to reach 70% of the people um, vaccinated before 4th of July. Um, and there seems to be a, a certain percentage of people that, um, you know, won't be vaccinated at all simply because they don't believe in it. And, and um, this could also be a factor, you know, as we move forward in the year. Okay, so things for us to be paying attention to, that certainly continues to be one. Um, uh, what, you know, whether we'll reach that herd immunity, how it affects the rest of the world as well in that effort um, to kind of put this behind us. And then uh, when it comes to inflation, as it was, is, will it be transitory or will it not? And there's plenty more that we would identify as topics that we might discuss uh, and factor into our thinking about uh, portfolio strategies. Let's go on to talk about what are some possible uh, financial planning strategies as we look ahead to try to respond to some of these challenges we might face from changing tax law. To do that next, I've got Scott Birmingham. Uh, Scott, why don't you uh, jump in and uh, maybe tell, help people explain uh, how a Roth conversion could be worthy of consideration. Sure, Chris. This has been a popular topic for the past couple of years just because of where uh, tax rates have been you know, historically low. Uh, but obviously it's come up quite a bit more with the Biden proposals. So this is just a typical scenario. Someone retires in the scenario age 66, their taxable income drops. Um, maybe they're drawing off cash, maybe they're drawing off their taxable accounts, which are more efficient. And then they delay social security and then RMD required minimum distributions kick in at 72. All of a sudden their tax rate, their taxable income goes up. So the idea behind this is to essentially as we've been talking about all day, do we make some decisions now? Do we start paying the taxes and maybe convert that to a Roth now rather than later? The idea you pay the taxes now at a lower rate, then over your retirement years, you're kind of lowering your, um, your taxable income over those years. This is obviously a case by case basis. We've been running it for a lot of clients, uh, but in most cases it actually works out in their benefit. They're um, building a tax-free bucket paying taxes now at a lower rate and lowering their taxable income in the future years. So by choosing to pay some in, in advance, you may pay less over time. Correct. And that's without taking into account the possible changes in tax law. So, right, we're just reflecting the 2025 changes in this program right now. Yeah, okay. Uh, contributing to a Roth, um, that has, uh, Roth 401k, excuse me. That comes up every once in a while, and I expect that question to be popping up uh, much more frequently for our clients who are still working. So if your uh, employer offers the feature where you contribute to a Roth 401k or 4 um, there's a little rule of thumb we have. Uh, basically, it is your age plus 20 is how much you should contribute to the traditional side of the 401k, and the remainder of that would go to the Roth 401k side. So just for an example, you're 50 years old, 50 plus 20 is 70. So 70% 70 would go towards your traditional 401k, the remainder towards the Roth side. Again, this is a case by case basis. We can run this for clients and people who wanna just take a look at how that would affect things out. Uh, exceptions to that kind of rule of thumb, if you're in the lowest tax bracket, do it all to the Roth 401k. If you are already in the highest tax bracket, do it all to the traditional side. Um, uh, no, I, I, sorry, it's all to the Roth, to the Roth in that case as well. Oh, to uh, the highest tax bracket? Yes, even in the highest tax bracket. And that is because in all likelihood, you're going to have the highest tax bracket later on too. True. And uh, the, high, the, uh, the likelihood is also that tax rates will go up from where we are today. So, um, 
and uh, who, uh, that we did have an interesting discussion on the Wicked Pissa podcast, which I frequently host um, in episode seven. If you'd like to hear more about this, this is from Professor David Brown uh, from the uh, University of Arizona. Um, it, it's his concept to how to do this. And I would say this could also apply, Scott, do you think to people who are in uh, IRA versus Roth IRA dilemma? Uh, absolutely. Yeah, I think you'd use that. I, I'm going to assume that the professor is a big fan of the Roth. He is. Yeah, you're right. Do you want to continue on or shall I jump in here? Uh, I'll let you grab this one. Feel free to chime in. So, you know, what's been coming up uh, is that we've had some examples with clients where they've been you know, facing some highly appreciated stock. And as I think Keats mentioned, one of us mentioned earlier is the notion of, should you maybe start realizing some of those gains sooner rather than later? And you know, I thought maybe just an anecdote or two might, might give you some things to consider. Um, we've had clients who've had uh, significant amounts of stock. We picked an arbitrary example of Apple stock, and we've had plenty of people who have lots of other stocks, but uh, where, you know, maybe bought it years ago, it's grown dramatically. And if they were to sell it, or if they were to have a mandatory realization of the capital gains because of death or some other circumstance, um, they're going to have a massive uh, tax to deal with. They're going to be in the 39.6% capital gains tax rate in that scenario. So it may be preferable to start selling some of that sooner rather than later and try to avoid being pushed into that higher capital gains tax rate. And another example of a, uh, someone who's in a high, tax, uh, high taxable income and has investments that are quite appreciated doesn't have to be in excess of a million dollars to have you end up in a million dollar, you know, a, a higher tax consequence for your capital gains, right? It remains to be seen as a, by, based on your income level or the gain itself. And right now it sounds like it's gonna be based on your income level. So if your income exceeds, even if the gain itself doesn't land you with a capital gain in excess of a million dollars, you still might be facing some sizable capital gains to that could turn into a tax rate that's doubled potentially from where it would be today. So sooner might be better than later in some of these instances. However, Keith, uh, we have a caveat and maybe you want to chime in on this issue that you know there is the possibility of retroactive taxation. Right, and I, I think it's important to be planning, planning that out a little bit. You gotta remember that capital gains rates and ordinary income tax rates are calculated based upon your adjusted gross income. And as you realize capital gains, that changes your adjusted gross income. And so, for example, if you're in uh, you know, a low bracket and you recognize a large gain, you could be pushing yourself into a much higher bracket, not only for the capital gain, but also on other income that you're earning. So you've got to balance some of that out. Um, I think, you know, strategizing how you're going to do this is going to be really important and it, it needs to be a planned, thoughtful approach, especially if we're going to have some of these laws as retroactive. Thanks. So I think what we're, you know, thinking about is maybe this year is one of those challenges where you have to make a probability equation and a calculated risk. Do I want to take the gain sooner rather than later? And it may be a question of, do I wait and see how things play out? Do I take the change now? In either instance, what we would encourage you to do is start the planning process sooner for any of these things we might be talking about whether it's for your estate planning or your financial planning to evaluate what's, what are my courses of action that I might entertain? One, uh, another you know, thing that I think people talk about is the idea of deferring losses. Well, losses might be more valuable next year than they are this year. Um, that being said, I, I would add a, a dose of uh, maybe you know, less mathematically uh, desirable, but maybe more um, emotionally desirable 
if I'm going to realize gains this year, I'm not really likely to want to defer losses to next year. I'm probably going to want to try and offset some of those losses this year when, when I know I have the tax consequence. Um, Keith, do you, do you follow that? What are your thoughts yeah. on that? Uh, you know, I, I, I think there, it's I think a lot of it is going to be unique to each person, what's going to fit their needs. And it really does come down to, uh, you know, what is a loss today may not be a loss tomorrow. Uh, that, that, you know, you, you, I mean, first of all, nobody wants to have a loss, right? We all want to have gains. So, you know, we would love, love to see a loss position uh, recoup, but you never know what's going to happen. And uh, bond portfolios, they do tend to, you know, as rates go up, the bond portfolio tends to lose some value. So, you, you know, long-term, we might have that continued loss next year. But, uh, you know, I, 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 I don't know. And I think it comes down to the security selection question. And sometimes yeah. we don't want the tax to be the driver. Right. Um, so there can be a consolation prize in the process of getting right. that uh, while re replacing a security with a better choice, we can get right. some benefit. Exactly. Um, one of the things that, you know, I think we run into a lot is though people um, often tend to um, hold on to assets and w at times would benefit from some uh, diversification, and you may want to think about uh, accelerating some of that diversification if you're in need of that from a portfolio perspective, rather than delaying. Uh, if it's better for your portfolio strategy, particularly in light of the possibility of different tax consequences later on. Um, another thing people are thinking about these days is gifting. And, um, you know, we, we would always put this, um, you know, one of the things that people think about is gifting to family members in a lower tax bracket. Maybe I can give them appreciated stock or, uh, you know, something along those lines, an appreciated asset of another type. Um, and instead of writing a check, uh, gift securities or appreciated holdings, if someone is in a lower tax bracket than you are uh, yourself when it comes to family or something like that. First thing we would suggest is make sure you've done that financial plan. We refer to our financial planning process as the 360 financial planning process. But we wanna make sure that we've modeled out, do you have enough to meet your needs before you start gifting? But if that um, is the case, it could make sense for gifting, but we do have another caveat again, this probabilities equation. If such a gift could, if some legislation is passed, it could trigger a, realiz a realization of the gain. So it complicates the process a little further. Could I step in there for just a second? Please do. I, you know, I think it's important to recognize who will pay the capital gains tax. So if you have a, that Apple stock a few slides back that you bought for $29 a share and today it's trading at 133, um, if you gift that stock to a child, you will pay the capital gains tax on the gift under these proposals. And so you just want to, you know, some people were under the impression that the recipient is going to pay the tax. No, it's the person who gives the stock. They will have to recognize the gain on that transfer. Um, so for that reason, you know, we're often looking at, well, maybe this year, because we don't know if the tax is going to be retroactive, Cash gifts might be a good idea. So, you know, in that sense, there's this dichotomy in advice as to what's the right choice. Another thing that I think should be considered, if you're going to make a gift of an appreciated asset, like a stock, consider using a charitable remainder trust as the in-between between your child and uh, the gift. What that does is you give the gift to the trust the stock can be sold without the capital gains event and the gift to the trust does not trigger the capital gains event under the proposed law. We can then give the child an income stream for the rest of their lifetime. And uh, as they receive the gift, a little bit of it will be uh, income, you know, capital gains income to the child. So now we're shifting the tax to the lower income taxpayer. So you know, that charitable remainder trust can be a good tool to, to get that uh, gift to a lower tax bracket and spread it out so it's recognized over time rather than in the year of the gift. Yeah, I, 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 love, the, 
I love the technique of a charitable remainder trust because, you know, it's also sometimes referred to as a, a capital gains avoidance trust. And I think we're going to see this more and more as a technique that has appeal, particularly with some uh, people who would have a desire for a cash flow who would really like the income supplement. And it's a desirable way to move an appreciated asset that might otherwise create some of these challenges into um, a, an income stream and perhaps mitigate the risk of, um, uh, of the, uh, tax, the, the high tax rate that we might right. deal with. Right. Um, also in the form of charitable intent, uh, get charitable gifts are also something people are giving more thought to. And I just wanted to uh, suggest there are a couple of things to consider here. Um, going forward, even, even you know whether or not new legislation occurs, you, you might really want to give thought to a couple of considerations when it comes to your charitable giving. Uh, again, put it in the context of your financial planning. Make sure you have the ability to have the resources that you need over your lifetime. But if there is excess that you still have the ability and would want to give it in part to charitable intent, um, again, consider using appreciated assets as the way to make those gifts rather than using cash that you've already had to pay tax on. Uh, you might be able to avoid the capital gain, the uh, charitable entity, uh, doesn't pay that taxation. So you can give the full value and avoid some taxation. Additionally, there's a process for people who are subject to required minimum distributions. You might entertain a charitable, a qualified charitable distribution. And uh, I think we have some details about that uh, on the next page, but um, that, that's a worthwhile endeavor. Um, also, sometimes people want to think about bundling their gifting into a, a specific year um, so that they have um, more charitable and uh, contributions to potentially have itemized deductions. Again, these rules are subject to change right now with there may be limitations on how much uh, deductions and how that works. But uh, at present, that would be an appropriate consideration. Scott, did you want to uh, elaborate anything on the the, char the qualified charitable distribution? Uh, sure. Um, so as previously mentioned, it's, a, it's another opportunity to uh, kind of control your taxes. So you can transfer money directly from your IRA to a qualified charity. So if your required minimum addition is uh, due, uh, you can contribute, well, transfer uh, up to $100,000 uh, per person to a qualified charity. So what it does, it satisfies your required minimum distributions for the year, uh, sends money to a charity, and that money that is sent to the charity is excluded from your taxable income, so there's no tax. So you do have a bit of control there. So this might be something going forward. Uh, if the tax rates do affect you going forward, uh, this may be a way to kind of lower that year after year. And as Chris mentioned, maybe even bunch a few of these into one year. This is something we can model for anybody. So if it is on their, in, uh, you know, an interest year after year, they can come in before end of year and we can model this and see if it works for them. And just to be clear, when you do the charitable, um, the qualified charitable distributions, it doesn't uh, help you with your itemized deductions, but the stock uh, idea does, the appreciated stock would. So some, gr some great opportunities uh, for those who have those resources. One additional item that we think is likely to be more and more prevalent is the idea of life insurance as a tool to pay increased, you know, potentially higher estate taxes, uh, possibly, you know, higher capital gains taxes, uh, higher, uh, you know, interest with uh, when we have no step up in basis and therefore more capital gains consequence. There can be a whole host of reasons why we might have some. Uh, capital gain. For just a little bit of levity, we included a, a little clip here. I don't know if anyone else has seen, of course, the, um, the uh, Groundhog Day, but a little bit of fun. We're talking about heavy topics here and a little, you know, how we'd lighten the mood. Um, along with life insurance are annuities. Um, 
it, oh, Keats, before I go on, do you want to just touch on the notion of an irrevocable life insurance trust as it might be a possible way to think about when people have the need for a, a, a life insurance as a way to replace wealth? Yeah, it's and, and quite frankly, it's not only replace wealth, it's a way to pay the tax at a discount. So what, what type of tax events do we face? Well, we've got an estate tax at death. And if we're over a million dollars in Massachusetts, we've got uh, you know, potentially over 30, uh, uh, $3.5 million. Oh. Oh. Um, we've got an issue for uh, IRAs, you know, traditional IRAs. You've got you know, roughly 25 to 30% of the amount in your traditional plan is income tax liability that has yet to be paid. Now we're facing capital gains taxes at death. Well, if we want to have calculate what all those taxes might accumulate out to, we can discount some of that by using life insurance to pay those tax liabilities instead of using our own assets to pay them dollar for dollar. Uh, so, you know, depending on the type of policy and the age and how early we start, you know, sometimes we can pay that tax at a significant discount. Uh, so it's uh, basically what we do is we create an irrevocable trust to own the life insurance uh, and you give to that trust on an annual basis to ideally enough to cover the premium. Uh, we do have to be mindful that Bernie Sanders is going to limit that to about $20,000 a year, but there may be other ways of, of structuring the policies uh, to, to get around that if we need a bigger premium to cover. What we're doing is we're moving money out of your taxable estate into an irrevocable trust that's essentially for your, either your spouse and children or just the children. And so we're moving money out of one pocket into another. So we're reducing the size that we have left for tax and getting it over to a side that is not going to be taxed. And we can create that so that it can pay estate tax liability, in income tax liability trapped in retirement accounts, capital gains taxes. If the capital gains at death is passed, a number of different issues, it can provide liquidity to uh, replace income that has to go to a spouse from a second marriage so that the spouse gets the retirement account and the kids will get uh, assets in place of that. We can use it to replace the assets uh, given to a charitable remainder trust so the kids still get the inheritance. There's a number of uses for these. It's something you know, it, so many people should be considering and unfortunately, oftentimes, uh, just because the word life insurance is used, uh, it's immediately discounted as undesirable. It, it, it's a great tool. Well, it's also you know worth remembering that it does require um, some level of health and underwriting financially and and for health. Um, but uh, people might be surprised how uh, frequently that people are eligible for coverage, uh, even as they age. So um, what, here at AMR, we do not um, use annuities as frequently at some firms. Uh, but people often have annuities, and it is worth remembering that when you, uh, one of the other things to consider is when you withdraw money from an annuity, you're uh, taking the taxable portion out, and that creates a bigger tax event. Um, you may uh, initially, so if you have a deferred annuity, you pull some withdrawal, you take the taxable portion first. You may want to be thinking about whether that's the best way to access funds when it is inside of annuity. Sometimes annuitization can be an effective tool to spread that tax out over either a lifetime or a period certain and spread it out over a number of years uh, rather than in, in a given year. Can I add one more thing on that, Chris? Oh, sure. Um, you know, if this capital gains realization at death occurs, um, using uh, your annuity wrapper around uh, an asset might provide some protection. I don't know that we know the answer to that yet, but you do have something that you've, we've talked about with uh, the SECURE Act uh, as a way of, of deferring the tax on, on that. Uh, that might be something that we'd have as an, as an option as well. So, you know, I think what we'll end up doing is, um, you know, once we have uh, more clarity, we'll certainly be talking about a lot of these strategies further. Our point right now is to encourage people, I think, to be uh, starting the process of getting counsel and looking at their particular situation and try to make some calculated risks as to what's the best approach for them going forward and giving you a variety of ideas as how we might do that. Agreed? Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
another instance where people might be thinking about how to deal with a uh, potential taxable situation where it could drive them into these, these concerns is the sale of a business. And if you have the flexibility where you could choose the timing of that, again, you may want to entertain whether you should take a lump sum in 2021, or if you aren't able to do it in 2021, you may be benefited by an installment sale um, and spreading out. So you're not taking all the taxable hit all at once. Again, there is the concern whether or not how these tax laws, uh, bills may be turned into law, which ones will pass, which uh, attributes will be included, and whether or not you'll have a retroactive tax consequence. So that's another challenge to this circumstance. I would just add to this slide, uh, uh, since we've already talked about the idea of a charitable remainder trust, uh, this is another instance where if you have um, uh, some charitable intent, you may want to entertain use of a charitable remainder trust or capital gains avoidance trust by taking a portion of the ownership of your company that you're looking to sell, move it uh, by you know, contributing a portion of it to a charitable trust um, so that at the time of sale, you might have some predictable income from that, get an initial deduction, you know, charitable deduction right away, spread out that capital gain over many, many years and minimize the impact of that. Um, so as part of that, not the entirety necessarily, but a part of that uh, consideration. Anything to add on that, Keats, uh, in line no. with what you said before? No, no, I just, uh, you know, we're actually looking for a lot of our clients to consider organizing business entities. And, you know, actually, we may be looking at selling to family members uh, to as a way of getting basis step up that otherwise we won't be able to get and using the installment sale approach as a way to make it more comfortable for the family to pay it. And in fact, that note could end up being inherited by the person who purchases the company. So they're paying themselves at the later years of the note. So there's a lot of possibilities for something like this. Thanks. Another instance we've run into recently are uh, people who have investment real estate. And uh, it's not in un unthinkable that people could have investment real estate that could exceed a million dollars in value or capital gains considerations. And, um, you know, one of the things to keep in mind here, again, is that you may be depreciating uh, the asset over many years so that, you know, the capital gains could be larger than you might expect when you think about, you know, what did I pay for the asset? What's it worth now? Um, so, you know, one, one thought is, you know, the low rates are lower today. They're likely to be higher tomorrow. How should we deal with that? One possibility is to sell now. Another possibility might be to uh, delay. Hopefully the rates, the market value increases, um, but I may have a higher tax burden and is it worth it? Um, we've had, uh, you know, people who have residences thinking about these kinds of considerations, but also their vacation and rental type properties. They might be more drawn to sooner is better uh, kind of mindset um, if, if you have that opportunity to sell more rapidly. People who have, um, you know, multifamily dwellings or an office building, uh, you may have a different set of circumstances. We had an interesting conversation recently where uh, the notion of maybe to spread that tax consequence by turning the property into a condominium so that you could delay the sale and possibly get the benefit of not having the full effect of that of sale all in one year. Um, so there's maybe some creative ways to think about it. We've already talked about the charitable remainder trust. Keats, a couple of final uh, points that you've got to go through. All right. So, uh, you know, I'm, I've been asked lately by a lot of clients is how can we avoid the risk of retroactivity? I mean, we got two big bills that are that have the potential for retroactivity. The first one we've talked about is uh, the 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 um, Chris Van Hollen bill, which would make death or gift a capital gains recognition event back to January one. I've seen conflicting reports as to whether or not the thirty nine point six percent tax bracket will be retroactive to April. Uh, when President Biden proposed it to the joint session of Congress in that address a few months ago. Uh, I've also seen that it's not going to be effective until next year. So we're not really sure what that is. But 
Uh, for married couples, I think there's a re really good concept out here that we know a gift to a spouse has an exemption under the STEP Act, under the Van Hollen proposal. And so what we can do is create what is often called a spousal access trust that gives, the, gives assets to, you know, appreciated assets to a spouse in a trust that uh, qualifies for a marital deduction. And then the spouse would be given, uh, who receives this trust, would be given in the trust what's called a power of appointment, the ability to say when he or she dies, who gets the benefit of the trust next. And they can exercise that power of appointment in favor of the spouse who created the trust for them. So you know, spouse A gives to spouse B in a trust and spouse B exercises a power of appointment to give it back to spouse A. Now those assets are structured in a way that are outside of their estate for estate tax purposes, but we've avoided the capital gains uh, uh, issue because it, it was done in a way that uh, was given to a spouse and is excluded from uh, the, the, uh, you know, the, the, this capital gains recognition event. So we, it's something that I think is really interesting. And unfortunately, it's only available to married couples. So if you're single, this is not a technique we can do, but it's something that I think it, 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 it merits some consideration for married couples who have significant uh, appreciated assets and don't want to harvest the gains right now. Um, just before changing the slide, I want to encourage people, if you have any questions, feel free to type them into the chat or the Q&A section. Did that take Keats? Uh, yes. Oh, did I? Here it is. It's changing. Okay. There we go. Um, it, 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 somebody uh, asked is about capital gains being retro, uh, retroactive. Is that typical? Um, it, it tends to, it, it, I don't want to get into politics, but there does seem to be a political consistency here. Uh, bills from, uh, in, well, at least during the Obama years, and now during uh, what seems to be coming out of the Biden administration, proposals are generally going to be effective on the date they are introduced. Uh, retroactivity per se uh, is not normal, where you go back, you may be introduced, like the, the Van Hollen bill was introduced on March 29th, uh, but it's retroactive to January 1st. That's not normal, it's not typical, but it's not unusual to have bills be effective on the day they're introduced, even though they may not be passed for several months later, okay? So I, I would have answered that simply by saying it's not the norm, but it is, it's not unheard of either. Yeah. Is that, it, is that, that fair? Yeah, it is, I, but it seems to be more common in, in, under democratic administrations that you have this uh, idea of saying, let's make it effective on the day we introduce the bill so you can no longer plan around it while we're trying to get it passed. Okay. Very good. All right. Um, so we also wanna make sure if we're doing estate planning, we want to make sure there are back doors so that if uh, some of these negative lead pieces of legislation are passed, we don't wanna get bitten in the backside by something that's passed after we take action. So using uh, disclaimers, uh, at least building it in so that if we make a gift to somebody uh, there's a way that it could go back to the intended recipient if the tax law change makes the, the action we're taking undesirable. Uh, we may want to use limited power of appointments to get things back to the original person who made the gift, but do it in a way that's outside of their estate so we avoid uh, capital gains recognition at the death of the, the person who receives the gift. There's a number of things like this that we just want to make sure that we're considering. Uh, and and uh, unfortunately, they've really drafted these pieces of legislation that there are not an awful lot of obvious loopholes. Uh, charitable remainder trusts are an important one. Uh, 1031 exchanges, if they're gonna remain on the books, there's talk that those will be taken away as well. Uh, installment note sales, uh, all of these things are, are gonna be the, 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 the go-to tools for us. And this spousal access trust, I think may be another one as well. So. Uh, this isn't going to work well for everybody, but there may be things that we can do. I think the biggest thing is to sit down and look at your particular situation. Come in early because if everybody's going to wait until uh, October, November, December, uh, we're not going to be able to accommodate everybody, whether it's on the financial planning side with AMR or the estate planning side with us. There's, there's just so many of us to be able to accommodate and try to handle these cases. So I think it's good to get a plan in place and then just be able to pull the trigger a little bit later in the year once we have better guidance as to what's going to happen. 
Well, with that in mind, Keats, um, would you care to share how people can connect with you? Uh, obviously, they can connect through our office and we can, ref you know, pass the phone sure. over, phone yep. call over with a transfer, but um, let people know how they should okay. connect. With so, you. you know, if you just want to learn a little bit more about estate planning in general, watch some of our pre recorded webinars. You can go to boydandboydpc.com. That's B O Y D A N D. B O Y D P C dot com. Look on our seminars page. You'll find all sorts of uh, webinars that are there pre recorded. You can also uh, uh, request an appointment on our website. Of course, you can always call us at 508 775 7800. All right. Um, with that, you kind of anticipated my comments uh, about Plan Now because. Uh, it does take time to get in to have uh, some of these conversations. You may want to incorporate your planning with multiple uh, advisors to give thought to how to address these issues. There may be differing perspectives on some of these issues, and ultimately you need to uh, give all of them consideration to figure out what's best for you. We think it's important for people to have that financial planning as a tool in the process, so don't delay. Uh, keep in mind that there's um, you know, some of this is a calculated risk. It's in a probabilities equation, trying to figure out what do we think is likely to occur because as of yet, we don't know. So that may affect with the timing. Uh, some of these decisions may be delayed, but you want to get the tools in place, the decisions sort of arranged so that you're prepared to address anything that may come up. Uh, with that being said, I think we've reached the point where we would uh, welcome any questions, if there are any. At this point, it does not appear there are any questions in the Q&A um, or in the chat. Um, let me mention this, that if you have uh, the desire to follow up with us with any uh, outreach specifically about your situation, or anything that we've talked about that you'd like to have greater clarity around, you can reach us at uh, our phone number, 833-426-7932. Someone's calling right now. Um, or you can, uh, you can always uh, connect with us through our website, amrfinancial.com. That being said, um, I think uh, I'll just, we'll leave it at this since there do not appear to be any other questions. Um, Guys, thanks so much for the time and effort that you put into today's presentation. Thanks for having me. All right. Thanks to the others there on mute saying thank you. I can see you mm -hmm. moving. All right. So with that, uh, we'll turn we'll turn things off. Thanks everyone for participating. Hope you find it worthwhile. If you didn't catch the entirety of the program, it will be posted to our website at amrfinancial.com.